Now, I'll start off by saying I am very excited to be discussing this topic. I am over bubbling with excitement. When you study prophecy, one of, one of the things when I came out as a Christian and, and you know, started to, to learn the Bible, man, when I needed refreshing, I would always go to prophecy. I would always go to the things that are happening right now because I believe that God is showing us and telling us things that are going on. As we look at the time that we're living in, we would be discussing there's one prophecy that normally puzzles people, that they don't understand, that they don't know, and this is what we will be discussing tonight. This is absolutely, unless you were living in the time of Christ, the most exciting time to be living in. The prophets of the Old Testament would have loved to see what we are seeing. And we will look at tonight at what these blood moons are telling us. I want to look at some of the verses tonight when Jesus said it would be like the days of Noah and the days of Lot. Now I'm going to put a disclaimer on this. Everybody say disclaimer. (laughs) I'm not saying that the Bible says that there are four blood moons. And I'm not saying that this is the definite time of the rapture. Like the rapture has to happen within this time. I'm not saying that. However, I am saying the rapture can happen before this service is over and we could be soaring through the clouds to meet Jesus. But I am saying this is one of the greatest signs that you will see being fulfilled in front of your very eyes. In Joel chapter 2, verses 31, it says, The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Now, I also want to say this, just because NASA says that it won't happen again for another 600 years, that does not hem God into time and saying he has to do something, he has to come back, something has to happen within the next year. God could do that 10 years from now and decide to put a blood moon in the sky. God's not hemmed in by the natural. So we will be discussing some very Bad things tonight. So everybody take a deep breath. And remember the words of Jesus. Fear not, for these things must take place. Now we will be going over a lot of information. (laughs) A lot. This is more of a teaching. The life application is get ready. Get ready. If you're not serving Jesus, serve Jesus. If you're on the fence, jump over the fence. If you need things to be cut out of your life, cut them out. Now, and I also want to say what I'm about to share with you is from Bible scholars and prophecy teachers who who I personally trust. This is their information that I have gathered together in research. I'm not this smart. (laughs) So, (laughs) So I just want to let everyone know. Pastor Todd used a perfect verse that I would like to use here. It's in Amos chapter 3 verse 7. For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secrets to his servants, the prophets. So that means God gives people in, insight. Like, this, like the, uh, the, the Bible talks about the, the, uh, the prophets of old, that he gave them discernment to, to tell Israel what to do. He gave them insight on what was going on. In Daniel 12, 4, it says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Once again, Pastor Todd said it, uh, I think it was this past Sunday, and he said that the knowledge of the Scriptures would increase. And that's absolutely 100% the way that you should see it. Because as things go, you read stuff in the Bible, and you will begin to see, God will give you insight. You'll be able to see things more clearly. Now, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 14, this is speaking of the creation of the sun and moon. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And watch this part. And let them be for signs. Everybody say, let them be for signs. There you go. Signs and for seasons and for days and years. Now, this word sign is O-W-T-H in the the Hebrew, and it means a signal. So God is using 
the sun and the moon for signals. Psalms 89, 37 says, like the moon, it shall be established forever, forever, a faithful witness in the skies. Okay? So let's read the entire context of Joel and Acts, because Joel's the Old Testament, Acts was requoted in the New Testament. It says, and I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, that's a total eclipse, and the moon into blood, that's the lunar eclipse, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Now it's quoted again in Acts chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. And I will grant wonders in the sky above and the signs on the earth beneath. Catch that. On the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. Verse 21. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, yeah, that's the good news. Now, what's the significance of these blood moons? I want to bring out something that the great and glorious day of the Lord is speaking of a time period, not a 24-hour day. When you read these things in context, you have to see if he's talking about a 24-hour day or if he's talking about a time period. The great and terrible day of the Lord is the tribulation period, the second coming during that time. Now, first of all, there's four in a row, which is called a tetrad. That in and of itself is rare. Now, now think about this. Lunar eclipses are, are rare, but a tetrad of four is even more rare. Now, to go deeper, four blood moons that happen on four feast days is even rarer. Every blood moon that they've had have fallen on feast days. So when you understand that, you, you get a more of an understanding that you do see God in control. Now, in the past 500 years, we've had three. But since the time of Jesus, there have been seven. So what we're in right now is the eighth. In the Bible, eight is the number of new beginnings and resurrection. Now, I'm not saying that's the rapture. <laughs> not saying that. But I find that interesting. In numerology, that's what number eight means. That means that we're nearing the close of the church age. That's what that's telling us. Now, let me say something here about those that don't believe in the rapture. There are people that don't believe in the rapture. You'll see them online. And that's very disturbing because the rapture and the resurrection are the same event. When you say you don't believe in the rapture, you're saying, I don't believe I will be resurrected. Hello? If you're saved, why be saved if there's no resurrection? Now, you may not agree the timing of the rapture, but you cannot say that there is no rapture. The rapture and the resurrection of the dead is the same event. Okay, so let's clear that, get that elephant out of the room, because Jesus said that this would happen. Paul spent most of his time in the New Testament writing about a rapture. Now, the word rapture is not there because it's the Latin word. It's harpazo means caught up. You could say the gathering together and the coming. If you read, I believe it's in Thessalonians, it talks about the gathering together and the coming of the Lord. Why didn't, it just, why didn't he just say one event? You don't see anything about the rapture in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because there's no church. You see, when Jesus says, I will go to prepare a place for you and I will come and receive you unto myself, that's one mention of the rapture. But when they asked about Jesus, when is the sign of your coming? He was talking about the second coming, about when are you coming to set up the kingdom and get Rome off of our throats? And that's the question that Jesus answers in Matthew 24. Does everybody understand that? Okay, we'll keep going. Now, these fall on feast days which are no coincidence. Feast days were celebrated by the Jews because they drew the Jewish mind to the things of God. Now let's look at the seven feasts. There's the Feast of Passover that they celebrated, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. 
These are Old Testament feasts that Jesus fulfilled. I'll give you an example. Jesus died on Passover. He was put on the cross at 9 a.m. He died at 3 p.m. That's the time of the morning and evening sacrifice. He fulfilled that to the T. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, Jesus was put in the tomb during that time. And if you study the history of what these mean, you will see the picture, but I don't have time to get into that. Also, you will see the Feast of First Fruits. Jesus rose from the grave on the Feast of First Fruits. On the Feast of Pentecost, you have in the book of Acts, the church was born on Pentecost. So you see, Jesus fulfilled them to the day, to the T. The Feast of Trumpets is a picture of the rapture. Jewish people today will tell you they do not know why they blow trumpets during the Feast of Trumpets. But we know what that means. That's talking about the resurrection. Now, if you look at the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, they were to keep the Feast of of Trumpets. They were to drop everything that they were doing and run to the temple and get right before God. Because the Day of Atonement is the picture when God is judging the world. And the Jewish people did not want to be judged by God. That's a picture of the tribulation. And then the Feast of Tabernacles is a feast that Jew and Gentile celebrate, which is a picture of the kingdom, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Do you see how God has given something in the Old Testament and Jesus fulfills it in the New Testament? That's why people that are like, we need to celebrate the feast. You know, they have like this Jewish thing that you have to go back to the Jewish people where you have a problem because there's no temple. You have to go to the temple to celebrate that. You can't just come to this church or that church and celebrate it. You have to go to Israel. And if we're a bunch of Gentiles in here, God doesn't look at us anyway for celebrating Jewish feast. So these are pictures. But in Jesus, you are fulfilling the feast because he fulfilled the feast. Okay, everybody understand that? Let's keep going. NASA has confirmed that that this cannot happen again for, like I said earlier, another 600 years. To a thousand years. Now, remember, blood moons does not mean that there has to be four. This says that the sun shall be darkened and the moon turn into blood. It doesn't say four of them, it just says that will happen. Now, this is not some Y2K thing. This is not some Mayan apocalypse thing. You know, women that go through birth pangs, they have false birth pangs. That's what that is. But there are real things that God is screaming to us. This is a biblical fact. And secular astronomers back that up. Now, God's timing is absolutely no uh, mistake in this matter. Jewish people know when they see blood moons, it's a sign to Israel. When they see a total eclipse, they see it as a a, a time of God dealing with the entire world. We have the blood moons that happened in 1493 and 1494. Now, I'll go on to say this also. Just because something happened in 1492 does not mean that 1493 and 94 are irrelevant. You see, this is a time period. People get caught up on saying, well, it has to happen between this blood moon and this blood moon. That's not what it's saying. Remember, there are no four blood moons in the Bible. It's just talking about blood moons. Okay? So going on, in 1493 and 1492, 1492 and 1493, what happened? The Jewish people were tortured and were sent away from Spain because they would not bow down to Catholicism. That's what happened. On March 30th, 1492, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella made a decree that all that 200,000 Jews would be expelled from Spain. No country wanted them, so they gave money to Christopher Columbus and said, "Hey, find us a place to live." We get the benefit of that, living in this great country. So this was a time period where great change took place. Now, the blood moons in 1949 and 1950. You remember in 1948, May the 14th, Israel became a nation. Pastor Todd talked about that during one of his sermons. Now, remember this. The Jewish people had not been back in Israel since Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, in A.D. 70 when the temple was destroyed. So this was a huge prophecy being fulfilled before probably y'all's very eyes because I wasn't born. And I'm not saying everybody, you know, the old, I'm not getting into the age deal. <laughs> 
Some of you may have seen it. Some of you may have read about it. Okay, I'm just going to move on. (laughs) But this is also the anniversary date when Solomon had the first temple built, 1948, May the 14th. And it's also the the, the same time when Ezra established the, the need and desire to build a temple. Now, they also, within 24 hours, they had the War of Independence, where seven armies surrounded them, and it lasted 15 months, and over 6,000 Israelis lost their lives. So we can see that once again, during a period of blood moons, it was catastrophe for Israel. And then there was the blood moons on 1967 and 68, and all of these fell on Passover and Tabernacles. Remember that. The Six-Day War took place and forced Israel to fight for their lives. God showed up supernaturally and destroyed all the armies that were going after Israel. And they walked in and, and claimed Jerusalem as the, as the, the capital. And that was one of the greatest days in, in the Israel's history. Then the blood moons of 2014 and 2015, Passover and Tabernacles. So what is happening during this time period? We'll back up a little bit. The entire world is changing rapidly. You can see the countries mentioned in Ezekiel and Psalms 83 right now are at odds with Israel. Russia is buying for power, and they are are secretly joining forces with Arab nations to attack Israel. America is on a slippery slope towards the back of world history. Anti-Semitism is growing, and European insurrectionists are trying to get the Jewish people kicked out of Europe. We can see that the beast system is laying the groundwork. Now, why do we say that? Why do scholars believe that? I want to give you some verses that you may have read before, but knowing what you know now about Islam, we will see exactly what these scriptures are saying. Now, what does the spirit of Antichrist look like? 1 John 2.22 tells us that, that they, de- that they deny That Jesus is the son of God. Remember, Islam says God has no son. Now, they deny deny that. They deny the relationship between the father and son. And they will not say that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. They will say he is a prophet. So they are denying the deity of Jesus Christ. The Bible says there will come a time in John 16, 2, where they, they will be killing those and thinking that they're doing God a service. We've seen that. We know what that means. Daniel 11.37 says that he will have no regard for women. He will not care about women's rights. We know that there are religions that take no care for women. All you have to do is see, watch the news. The Bible calls him a, a, an Assyrian. That tells us he comes out of a certain area. The Bible calls him the king of Babylon which is Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and etc. All of these are Muslim countries. And this system, the Bible says, will behead you if you do not follow them. We see beheadings right now on the news. In fact, it's so common now, you'll see them on Yahoo News and keep scrolling. Now, he also, the Bible says, he will rule with peace, according to Revelation 6.2. He has a bow. With no arrows. So he rules with a false peace. And Daniel 8.25 says, by peace, he would destroy many. There's an a Islamic scholar. I can't even pronounce his name. <laughs> but he says, jihad is not inhumane despite its necessary violence and bloodshed. Its ultimate desire is peace, which is protected and enhanced by the rule of law. The Bible says that the Antichrist will also come and change laws, times, and seasons. So I'm not trying to connect dots that cannot be connected on their own. Now, everything started in the Middle East, and everything will end in the Middle East. Now, what happened since the first blood moon in April? The Israeli war began with Hamas for the Gaza Strip. ISIS has emerged. They're well-funded. They're well-trained. We see ISIS trying to approach our borders. We see beheadings overseas. They're crucifying Christians, and they're beheading children. We see this on the news. I was talking to Pastor Brandon earlier, and he was talking about how he read how women were beginning to flock to ISIS to to be the homemakers for those animals. 
They have promised to fly their flag over the White House and bathe us in our own blood. That's their own terminology. They're trying to take the entire world into World War III. Russia is rebuilding an empire, trying to take over Ukraine, birthing the rise of Gog and Magog. We have never seen that before. I want you to look at the, the, uh, the picture. What is, what's the, re- the reason for these flags? There's an Islamic prophecy that says when you see black banners flying, the Mahdi will show up and take the world over for Islam. The prophecy is that the black banners will appear from the east, in which they did, and they will kill you in a way that has never been done by a nation. Speaking of the Mahdi, if you see him, give him your allegiance, even if you have to crawl over ice, because surely he is the caliphate, the Allah, the Mahdi. If you see the flags, join the army, and no one can stop that army till it reaches Jerusalem. Have you seen this on TV yourselves? I'm sure this is not the first time you've seen this. Now, Muslim eschatology is the same as ours. They believe that a ruler is coming. They believe that it's a false prophet that will come with him. They believe his name is Jesus or Isa, and he will convert the world to Islam. He will literally tell the Jews to convert or die. Their their teaching says that trees will literally say, here's a Jewish person here, come and kill him. That's their belief. The Mahdi does the same things that the Antichrist of the Bible does. And I found it interesting that when you look at the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the colors are red, white, pale, which is green, or in the Greek chlorophyll, and black. This is the color of the Palestinian flag. That's just something, I'm not saying that's the the, the deal, I just found that interesting. (laughs) All right, Iran is partnering with Hamas to give them weapons to fight Israel. Have you heard of Ebola? I read an article yesterday, as as of yesterday, 4,000 people have already died out of 8,000 cases And they're saying by January 2015, the CDC has predicted 550,000 new cases. And they said that it could be a a case of underreporting, and that figure could rise to 1.4 million. The Bible says that there will be pestilence in the last days. You've heard of SARS, all these different things. We are seeing the formation of Ezekiel 38. I'll give you the names. They're mentioned in the Bible, but this is the names that they have now. Russia, Iran, Libya, the Sudan, and Turkey. These are the nations that go after Israel, and they are led by Russia. So when you watch the news, keep your eye on all what's going on. I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm saying this to show you that God's word is all true and that nothing is taking him by storm. Russia and all these Arab nations are not sneaking up on God. There's a spy in the sky And he has his eye on the apple of Israel. And if you read what happens during Ezekiel 38 and 39, God sends an earthquake and kills them all. (laughs) We also see the, the form of the Psalm 83 coalition forming. And we've only been through two blood moons. Think of that. That just happened October 8th, this last one. So let's look at the chart with the blood moon in the chart. You see here the Passover 415, I don't know if you saw that one, then October 8th, then there's the March uh, 20th, 15th, that's the total eclipse. Then you have, once again, Passover uh, 4, 4, 15, and Tabernacles 9, 28, 15. This is what NASA has said. They fall on feast days. Once again, that's God telling us something. What's the significance for us today? In Luke 21, 25, and 28, it says, There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and upon the earth, dismay among nations, and perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves. Men fanning from fear the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and they will see the coming of the Son of Man in the cloud with power and great glory. But when, they, when, when these things, listen, begin to take place, Now, this, let me keep going. But when you see these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your head because your redemption is drawing near. This is not the rapture. This is the second coming. Back up seven years, maybe a little bit. How close are we to the Lord's return? When you begin to see all these things happening, 
wars, rumors, pestilence, uh, signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. Now look, and we can see that there are sign, signs in the stars. Have you ever heard of, of the sun? Have you ever heard of solar flares? This is what happens. At the turn of the century, they begin to study the intensity of the sun. In November 16, 2012, the sun erupted with plasma in a solar system. Now, a strong solar flare could knock out the electronic grids, sending us, sending us back to the dark ages. Now, when you read the book of Revelation, you see horses. <laughs> you never know. You never know. I mean... If you look at it logically, if it knocks out electronic grids, you cannot start a vehicle. Trucks cannot bring food, so you see famine. You can't call someone. That's what they were worried about, having an EMP bomb blow up over the United States because instantly it would knock out the grids, and they were worried that, that people with suitcase bombs would be in different areas of the city and set them off at one time. And people would not be able to call each other to see how everything was going. No one would know what was going, out, going on. And that would have caused mass chaos. Now, is everybody all right? <laughs> all right, as we keep going. We also see in the book of Revelation that the, the sun will scorch men with fervent heat. So I don't laugh too hard when they talk about global warming anymore. Because that's obviously coming. That was a joke. <laughs> On July 12th, 2014, there was actually an American tourist that died in Israel when he heard the signs going off about the Gaza war, the Gaza war, literally fulfilling that scripture about men's hearts failing them from fear. I said all that to say, when you read the Bible, it's not far-fetched. There are writers in the Bible that did not know what they were seeing, but they were describing things. In Luke 21, 25, there will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. If you look at the constellation of this picture, that's the eye of God. And there's other things that you can Google that are amazing about what's happening in the stars in our solar system. Now, look at an asteroid. Look at the one that hit Russia on February 2013th. NASA said that it was a 50-foot rock and it weighed 10,000 tons, traveling at 40,000 miles per hour. It injured 1,200 people and damaged thousands of homes. By the way, an asteroid will hit this earth in the book of Revelation. In Luke 21, 26, it says, For the powers of the heaven will be shaken. If you read in Revelation chapter 8, verses 10 and 11, it says, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven burning as if it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the foundations of water. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became wor Wormwood, and men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Now, I'll look this up in the Greek. That word great means exceedingly loud and mighty. That word star is the, where we get the word astere, where we get asteroid. And that word lamp means tail. So we can see, obviously, that's an asteroid. The word for astere in the Greek is where we get the word, where they get the word astronomy, where we get the word astronomy. So this is how you can see things more clearly when you look in the Bible. Now, this kind of disturbed me, and I'll just share it with you, since this is probably a kind of disturbing message anyway. Let's say for an example, I had read this. If a sizable asteroid struck the edge of Mexico, it would cause 20-foot high waves moving at about 500 miles per hour into America. It would destroy everything 50 miles inland. The Earth's temperature would raise to, from 280 degrees to 700 degrees. And particles would come up, fill the atmosphere, and it would block the sun for weeks and even months. But can that really happen? Let's look in Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then I really wanted to torture myself. So I started looking 
at what they had, they, they were talking about a process of elimination. And it said the north, from, in Daniel 1140, you see that the king of the north is there. You see the king of the south is there in Dev, Daniel 1140. In Revelation 16, 12, there is, there is the kings of the east, but there's no west. So, there, so some of them were saying that it's possible this could hit the Gulf of Mexico or sometimes in the west. And that's why you see no west in the book of Revelation. I know. Should we have an altar call right now? <laughs> but once again, it's only speculation. Okay, let's just keep going. Also, it was interesting the Smithsonian said that at the time of Noah, hail Bob Comet passed through the heavens. Amazingly, that the, and on March 23rd, 1997, which is, was also a feast day, which was also, there was one blood red moon over Jerusalem during that time. As it was in the days of Noah, hail Bob Comet, one of the stars passed through the galaxy, Living today, as it is in the days of Noah, hail Bob Comet passed through once again. I thought that was very interesting. <laughs> I know you like, we still have a ways to go. <laughs> now, how does this tie in with the days of Lot and Noah? In Luke 17, 26 and 29, it says, And just as it happened in the days of Noah... So shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. And it was the same as it happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planning, they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone and destroyed them all. Now when you look at this, Nothing has to happen before the rapture comes. We don't have to have some great big, the Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, they were just doing what was natural. And all of a sudden, it came. In Genesis 6, 13 and 14, it says, Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. I found it interesting that the Hebrew word for violence is Hamas. Thought that was interesting. Not, not trying to connect dots. But we do know that terror is flooding the world even as we speak. Now, in Genesis 7, 11 and 12, it says, On the same day all the fountains of the great deep burst open, and the floodgates of the sky were opened, and the rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, science tells us that when plates shift under bodies of water, with, would, would be caused by an earthquake. It sucks water down and then throws it up. That's what happens when the tectonic plates shift. I'm talking now. I'm talking about earthquakes, volcanoes, and blood moons, and how they re relate to the time of the end. Now the flood happened by the fountains of the deep opening up, and also rain coming from the the top, from the sky. Now when tectonic plates shift, now what happens? A tsunami happens. That's what we call a tsunami. And when the rain from the top pours down on us, we call it a hurricane. Right? I mean, that's, if you want to talk about the worst rain that there is, don't, we, we in, the, in the South know a hurricane. So at the same time, you had tsunamis, you had the fountains of the deep opening up, and you had rain coming from the top. Can you see how we're living in the days of Noah just based on weather? Listen, I'm reminded of the days of Noah on Rue de Bailly in, in, uh, in Dulles every time it rains. If you want to ask me how do I know we're living in a time of end, go to that corner when it rains. Now, in Luke 21, 25, there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars upon the earth dismay among the nations in perplexity at the roaring of the sea. That word roaring in the Greek is echo. Okay? Now there were some testimonies from people in Indonesia in 2004 that were standing on their balcony. They're not Greek scholars. They said when they saw the tsunami happening, it sounded like an echo. They said the very thing that Jesus said. Think about that. Now, 
as it was in the days of Lot. And by the way, we always hear about tsunami warnings nowadays. You look on the news, there's always, I mean, I get updates on my phone. There's a tsunami warning here, a tsunami warning there. Now, as it was in the days of Lot, the Bible says in Genesis 19, 24, Then the Lord rained down fire and brimstone, sulfur from the sky, on Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, in Genesis 19, 27 and 28, it says, Now Abraham rose early in the morning and went to a place where he stood before the Lord. He was in Beersheba, okay? And he looked down toward Sodom and toward all the land of the valley, and he saw and behold, the smoke of, a land, of the land ascended like a smoke of furnace. This is what Abraham saw. Now, this is what a volcano cloud looks, at, looks like. Now, keep this in your mind because we're going to talk about that. Is everybody still okay? Okay. We know that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and with brimstone. Now, some geologists say, you know, because some people believe that God sometimes uses the natural. You have to understand Abraham was looking at a distance and he saw fire and brimstone coming down. You know, when you talk about blood c coming out, that looks like lava. Now, the southern part of the Dead Sea is surrounded by volcanoes. It's surrounded by volcanoes. Let's look at a picture of a volcano erupting. That's what it looks like. When volcanoes erupt, it sends lava into the air along with fire and brimstone. And this is possibly what Abraham saw looked like it was coming down out of heaven. In Joel 2, verse 30 and 31, I would display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. I just didn't want you to forget. Now, if you look at the chart of the blood moon once again, the sun being darkened is a solar eclipse, which we can see happens on March 20th. Now, blood is a metaphor for death. But it also looks like blood spewing out. We also know that in Joel's prophecy, he, he uses a different word in the, in the Hebrew. Columns in the Hebrew is the word amud, and it means a column or a building. Joel uses the word tamara, which means a cloud with a column appearance that tells us that Joel was talking about a column, a cloud of smoke. Now, when you see that it says blood, fire, and columns of smoke, it's obviously talking about volcano eruptions. Did everybody see that? Okay. So this prophecy is telling us that with these blood moons come volcanic activity. That's what it's telling us. For this to not just be a regular cycle, this must happen. Geologists have said that if Mount St. Helens were to erupt, it would kill everyone in the United States. So you can see the power behind volcanoes. Now, are we seeing more volcanoes during this time? Now, one more month before the first blood moon, which was March, there were 20 places around the world that the Smithsonian said had volcanic activity. There's a couple that made the news. Costa Rica had an eruption. Indonesia had one. 75,000 people had to evacuate. Tremors were reported from volcanoes in Ecuador, Peru, Hawaii, and Argentina. It was maybe two weeks ago that I read the, the thing about Mount St. Helens. Volcanoes are erupting in Iceland, Indonesia, and Mexico right now. The Philippines, I mean, I'm sorry, the Philippines, And Papua New Guinea, you might have heard this. I was reading an article yesterday, and geologists said that we are in a season of volcanoes, if that even exists, it said. So Japan recently had one erupting. It killed 48 people. Earthquakes have happened in Chile. that had an 8.2. And Yellowstone Park had a 4.2, and on and on and on. So we see that we could literally be in the time that Joel was talking about. Now I'm going to get to the good news. <laughs> In Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, And it shall come to pass afterward, I will pour out my, my spirit on all flesh. 
Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out of my spirit. And then he says in Joel chapter 2, verses 32, it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the good news. And we get to be a part of that. So I hope as what we talked about, you know, because people say, oh, they've been saying that for years. Jesus said when you begin to see all these things happening, that we, that generation will see the coming of the Son of Man. In Matthew 24, 14, it says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. I know of a couple of ministries on TV right now, their telecast goes into every nation on the face of the earth. So Jesus literally can come back. My cry to the Lord is, Lord, please don't leave us out. You know, I mean, I was reading some stuff about China. They got people getting saved and we have people that are falling away. Come on, it's not time to play church anymore. It's not time to patty cake with the world. It's not time to walk on the fence. Push the fence down. We do not know how much time we have. Remember, he says in Luke 28, 21, 28, now when these things begin to take place, and these things are beginning to take place, right? We're seeing all this right now beginning. Jesus said, when you see these things begin to take place, straighten up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Mark 13, 28 and 31. Learn from the fig tree. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Now when you read behind, like Pastor Todd says, scholars that are worth their salt. And then when you go to Israel, you will see fig leaves on their government buildings. Because there are some that say, well, that's not talking about Israel. Listen, the vine is a symbol of Israel's spiritual privileges. The fig tree is a symbol of their national privileges. That means them as a nation. Now, the olive tree is a symbol of their religious privileges. But notice it says, learn from the fig tree. That's what Jesus said. When you see its branches become tender and put forth its leaves, you know that summer is here. So also when you see these things begin to take place, know that he is at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away. What is he saying? The generation that saw Israel born. Right? That's what it's saying. That Learn the parable of the fig tree. Remember, Jesus cursed the fig tree and they didn't produce fruit. Remember the story of the vineyard. He gave, basically what's happening, he gave it to the church. He gave us the responsibility because the Jewish people denied him. That's why the Lord's going to come take us out of here. Oh, I think I just plugged pre-trib. He's going to take us out of here, and then you will have the time of Jacob's trouble. You will have the time when God will focus his attention on the Jewish people. That's the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, the key word in here is when we begin to see all these things. Now, I don't know how long a generation is. I'm not saying it's 50 years, 70 years, 100 years. But giving everything that we just had, I think that I built a case to know that we're close. I'm not putting a date. I'm not putting a time. I say every, every year, hey, man, somebody will ask me, you think it could happen? I think it can happen right now. I think it can happen this year. I think it can happen in a year passes. Yeah, I think it could happen this year. Another thing happened. Oh, it can happen this year. So I'm not someone who's saying that it has to happen, but I'm just saying it can happen at any moment. Now, the last part. Why do they fall on Passover and tabernacles? 
And once again, these men of God have studied this, and I'm just gleaning from their knowledge. There's a lot of stuff out there. Some of it's not good. Some of it is good. You have to be careful. You have to watch because you don't know. You know, there's some people there. They're called preterists. They believe that all this happened already. My, once again, take a lamb, put it in a cage with a lion. You'll see we're not living in the millennial reign. Because the Bible says that a lion shall lay down with the lamb or the wolf. Your kid would be able to play in a cockatrice nest, which is a rattlesnake nest. If any of you have children, if you believe that, just go take them, put them in a cockatrice nest, <laughs> and you will be arrested. All right. And then they'll say, oh, you're going to bring drink the Kool-Aid and bring out the snakes. Okay, back to this. <laughs> the Feast of Passover is a picture of the deliverance from Egypt. Right? It's a, it's a picture of them repenting, of, of the blood being put on the doorpost. Remember, Jesus died on Passover for our faith, for our repentance. His work atones for our sin. Passover is about redemption and repentance. The Feast of Tabernacles is a picture of the kingdom of God coming to this earth. The kingdom of God is the feast that talks about the millennial reigns. The Jew and the Gentile are, the, are, are able to celebrate this feast together. What was the message of John the Baptist? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. What is our message today? For, John said that in, for Jesus' first coming. The church is saying it for the second coming. Why is it on Passover and tabernacles? Repent, for the kingdom is at hand. I believe that that is probably why they fall on Passover and tabernacles. God is telling us the signs, the signals. He is telling us, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Can we stand? What's the life application? Let's get ready. Come on, it's time to cut it out. It's time to say, well, I'll witness tomorrow. It's time to say, you know, I I'm not going to keep putting this off. You know, we have things that pull and plague, you know, our lives. They, 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 they torment us. We, we want to run back to things of the world. Now is not a time. Have your oil ready in your lamp. Come on, now is the time. You know, oh, they've been saying that for years. Don't be the scoffer the Bible talks about. Come on, they said, where is the promise of his coming? No one denied that he was coming. They just kept saying, oh, they've been saying that. They've been saying that. Remember in the church of Sardis, it says, wake up or I will come at an hour when you do not think that I will. He wasn't talking to the church that was awake. Go back and read it. He was talking to the one that was sleeping. If you look at the, the, at the, the, uh, the wicked servant uh, and, the, and the good servant, the Bible says he came back at a time that that wicked servant did not know. Look, I mean, so when you look at it, God's not trying to sneak up on us. You can't get any more clearer than a heavenly billboard. He is telling us, I am about to return. Do my work. Put the hand to the plow Cut everything out of your life that is tripping us up. And I'm speaking also to myself. What's that old song they used to say? Uh, Church, someday I'm leaving and I'm going to a meeting around the throne. That can happen at any moment. Do you understand that? Look, when you get bogged down with the worries of this world, look to the east. You can see Jesus taking you from that situation that that situation that is holding you that is binding you you could be delivered from that situation God is amazing let's put down the trinkets and toys and grab on to the jewel which is Jesus Christ now I'm going to ask you if you don't know the Lord I want to see you raise your hand because I want to pray with you the Bible says today is the day of salvation. You're not promised tomorrow. We don't even have to talk about the rapture of the church. You could die on the, on, on the way home. Your heart could stop while you sleep tonight and you would wake up somewhere. 
you will wake up in eternity. So I'm assuming that everyone here knows the Lord. Praise God. Now I'm going to ask, is there anybody here that is dealing with some issues that, that has said, you know, I've always heard that maybe the rapture was going to come. Maybe, that, you know, we were, we were in the time of the end, but now I see and I need to make some things right with God. I'm going to open up these altars and I'd like some altar workers to come up. Now's the time to get right with God, get real with God. Now's the time. If you can say, I want to put oil in my lamp. I don't want to play around anymore with Christianity. I don't want to play footsies with the world anymore. I want to make a decision. As we begin to close this service, I'm not going to belabor the point. We would like to pray with you. We'd like to talk with you. But I'm asking you, I'm going to pray for you right now. Father, we come to you in the name of your son, Jesus. Lord, I'm asking that you would reveal to your children, areas of their life, areas of my life, Lord, that are unpleasing to you, God. Father, I, I do that first, Lord. I ask, search my heart, God. Search me and know me, Lord. All of these here, God. Father, I'm asking that you would reveal plans and purposes that you have for their lives, God. Lord, I'm asking that you would do heart surgery, Lord, on those that are here and maybe the sin and deceitfulness of this world has hardened their hearts. God, I'm asking that you would soften their hearts. Lord, I'm asking, Lord, as you are about to return one day, God, that you would find a church, God, that is on fire for you, that is working, that is busy for you, God. That we, are, we would not be lukewarm, but Father, that we would be hot. The Bible says that you would rather us be hot or cold because lukewarm, you'll spit us out of your mouth. That means you cannot be cold and you cannot be lukewarm. All God will accept is hot. Maybe you have cooled off because of circumstances, because of being lackadaisical, of th taking things of the gospel for granted. Be healed in Jesus' name. Lord, I ask right now that you would break those hard hearts, God, if there'd be any among us. Lord, that you would open up their hearts, that you would give them a burning passion and fire, God, to do your works. God, to grow closer and more intimate with you, God. Father, we thank you right now for this gathering. God, we thank you that we don't have guns in our faces, God, that we can come and proclaim boldly the kingdom of God coming to this earth, God. Father, we thank you right now for what you're doing in their families. God, that you are changing circumstances, that you're dealing with those that they need a witness to. God, that you are softening their hearts, that you are setting up divine appointments. Lord, that you are casting the net, God, as we begin to fish like never before, Lord, and call those people into the kingdom by your power and by your might. Father, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.